And I, what I discovered is that there were three basic approaches that scientists had, had taken to try to explain this DNA enigma. And the, the first was just the kind of the raw bootstrap, you know, seat of the pants, let's, let's try it by chance. And um, there was a famous French scientist who was a colleague of Francis Crick's, Jacques Minot, and he, he, he wrote a book called Chance and Necessity, and he said the, 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 the basic job of the scientist is to explain everything by reference to chance, random variations, random processes, or necessity, by which he meant natural laws. If I drop a wallet here and it falls to the ground, we'll say that that happened because of the law of gravity, and scientists will say that, therefore, that happened by necessity. It was lawful. It had to happen that way. And, and Minot basically said, that's, that's what scientists should do. We should explain things by chance and necessity. And so I thought, well, how have, how, how have scientists fared at explaining the DNA enigma, the information necessary to produce the first life by reference to chance, necessity, or as Minot said, sometimes we combine them, the, the combination of the two. Well, so let's look at these briefly, and you'll see why I think this is such a profound mystery from the standpoint of the materialistic evolutionary approach to the origin of life. The first, the first approach is chance, and there's a basic problem here that uh, was almost universally recognized, and it's the problem of the complexity of the cell, but it, there's a mathematical dimension to it. If you're a person of mathematical, computational, computer background, you know about combinatorials and how, how the, well, let me illustrate. If you've got, um, back to my snaplock beads here, the, these, these represent the amino acids. There are 20 possible protein-forming amino acids that could attach to a growing chain that would build a protein at any given site. So if you have just two, pro, uh, two amino acids linking together, how many possible combinations are there? Uh, I heard a couple of math guys say 400, and that's right. Our intuition is always, it's 20 plus 20, right? But no, if you think that each one can combine with 20 others, and there are 20 possibilities on each, on each, at each site, it's actually 20 times 20. Now let's go and we'll, let's just say, let's add another amino acid to the chain. Now how many possibilities are there? Man, this is a smart audience. Okay, okay. I, I was still starting to rev up the mental math, you know. Okay, so now a fourth, what do we get? 160,000, right? Okay, and on and on. What's happening to these numbers? Are they building just, are they, are, is this just, go, are they going up in an additive fashion or a geometric or exponential fashion? Okay, exponential. Now, here's, I'm going to look really smart because I already figured this out. Okay, <laughs> all right. A, a modest length protein is going to be in the order of 150 amino acids long. The, the cell needs many proteins that are much longer than that, the, the gigantic polymerases, for example. Um, but, but let's just take a modest length protein of 100, 150 amino acids long. Now, what, what, think of the combinatorial problem that we have. That's the, num the number of possible arrangements of amino acids that you could generate. 20 times 20 times 20 times 20 times 20, out to the 150th power. 20 to the 150th is also, now this is where I get to look smart, 10 to the 195th power. I worked that out on my little calculator beforehand. Um, but the point is, that's an unimaginably large number. Now, you can quibble about that, and you can notice that there are more than, there's more than just one functional protein, and that's correct, so that adjusts the numbers downward. But then you also have to take into account that <clears throat> there's only a certain kind of linkage that can take place chemically, and the odds of that are only one and two at each site, and there's only one kind of amino acid, a left-handed, not a right-handed kind. And so when you take it all into account, here's the bottom line. The number of combinations of possibilities vastly dwarfs the number of possible events there could have been since the very beginning of the universe, since the Big Bang. There are only 10 to the 80th elementary particles. There are only 10 to the 16th seconds since the beginning of the universe. There's only so fast that interactions can take place between molecules. So think of it this way. All the number of combinations that could possibly be, be represent a vast haystack grander than the size of the entire universe, and what we're looking for is something like a tiny, tiny needle smaller than the smallest elementary particle. And we have to find that in a blind, undirected search, all right? Most scientists working on the origin of life have realized that the, that the complexity of the cell, the combinatorial complexity, is so great that we will never, ever find life in, in that way, in that way. Through time plus chance. Through time plus what chance. What you're saying is statistical improbability giving the grandest, uh, uh, I guess, uh, number that is presented as a probability for the existence of the universe, which is right around 
billion years right now, I've read recently, correct? Right, right. And so you're saying that there's no way for just this one expression of creation to have taken place statistically within that time period, given the immensity of the probability. The odds are always better that it didn't happen by chance than that it did, and they're immensely in favor of that it didn't. It's, it, the probabilities are so small. And what's happening and so exciting inside the black box, so to speak, is what we're seeing is that scientists, everywhere they go, they keep seeing more and more overwhelming evidence that there is just no way that this could have evolved or happened. The numbers are so grand, it takes not just a tremendous amount of faith, but it goes against all reason, all probability, and all really scientific prob uh, possibility that it could have happened that way, and yet they still defend it vehemently. Right, because there are some other possibilities. But l let, me, let me turn the corner from the negative to the positive, okay? And I just want to make you aware. I know David's here. It yep. is 840. 840. And oh. so we need to get him out here. Five minutes, and I'll tell you the end of the story. Uh, okay. okay. And right. then we'll get him Go out Go for here. it. Okay. I'll stay here with right. you. There's two other... <laughs> <laughs> and he, he's a big guy. I'm not going to mess with that. <laughs> let, me, let me turn the... There's, there are other possible purely naturalistic approaches. In my studies... I found them equally, e equally inadequate. And if you want to know why, there's a big fat book that we're advertising in the back that's going to be out in June called Signature in the Cell. But I want you to have the positive side of the story, and this will segue to David, okay? And that is that I, I had an epiphany, when I, because one of the things I want to know is, was Dr. Thaxton right? It, could this be made a scientific conclusion, the idea of intelligent design? And when I got to Cambridge, one of the things I began to study was how do scientists reason about events in the remote past? And I found the works of the masters. I found the works of Charles Darwin. And I found the works of his mentor, Charles Lyell. And they had a simple principle, and it was that if you want to explain events in the remote past, you should invoke causes that are known to produce the kind of events that you're trying to explain. Makes sense? You want to explain volcanic ash? Don't invoke an earthquake. Invoke a volcanic eruption, right? And so I, be I one day found the front piece on Lyell's, Lyell's book, okay? And this is what Lyell, and it, it, it had this amazing subtitle, and, this, and it, it, it put the light on for me. It said, be, uh, principles of ge geology being an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. That's how we gotta go about things. We try to explain things by reference to causes that we know can produce the effects in question. And I asked myself a simple question. What is the cause now in operation for the production of digital code? What is the cause now in operation for the origin of information? I knew that chance, necessity, the combination of the two didn't work. I'd studied them carefully. Nobody disagreed with me, not even the good Professor Dawkins as late as last year. But there is a cause that we know can produce digital code. That cause is intelligence. We're doing it right now. I'm con conveying information to you. It's maybe not an intelligent design, but at least some kind of mind is behind all this communication. Okay? So what I realized, oddly, was that Darwin's own method of reasoning, where we infer the cause which is known to produce the effect in question is the best explanation of the thing we're trying to explain, that his method actually revived the argument from design. The, the, the data were different, the conclusion is different, but using his method, which I honored and followed, I came to the conclusion that the best explanation of the digital code that's involved in life, the central feature of living systems, has to come from an intelligence. And that is the basis, not of just a critique of evolutionary ideas about the origin of life, but a positive case for intelligent design based on an established scientific method of reasoning, in fact, Darwin's own method. That's my story. Wonderful. All right.